All right, so this time we are building the model for associated with the frame analysis. It's the same uh, frame, just slightly modified dimensions. And the purpose of this Abacus uh, model movie video is to help you be able to make frame analysis using Abacus. So we're back into our original Abacus uh, window. This is the first one. Once again, it's going to be all about the modules. This time we are in the first module called part and we're going to be creating a frame. And this frame will be a 2D frame. It will be deformable. And the base feature will be a wire. Its approximate size will be 180, same as before. And that brings me the familiar grid that we have been talking about, at which point I'll dismiss the part manager. Just to look at it more closely, I'm going to zoom out. You're seeing what the window looks like. Great. Now, um, it is giving me the option to draw this uh, wire frame in many different ways. I'm going to pick the point by point approach. And then it's asking me to pick a starting point for the line or enter the X, Y coordinate system. So I'll start with the bottom left coordinate, which will be minus 60, comma minus 90, same as the shear wall example. The end point for the line will be minus 60, comma 90. The next point will be 60, comma 90. And then the last point will be 60, comma minus 90 and there that's the frame that we've been uh, that i'm building as i mentioned to you earlier the frame i'm going to build is going to have transpose geometry that means it will be 15 feet high and 12 feet wide and your homework problem asks you to do the frame with the transpose dimensions okay and at this point that the wireframe is done i'll exit out of this uh, uh, module, I'll say that the sketch for the wire part is done, and that's my 2D frame so far. There we go. Next, I'm going to move on to the module called property, and this is where all the action is going to occur. This is where things are going to be a little bit new. Once again, I'll create an elastic material steel. Be mechanical, elastic, and the Young's modulus will be 29,000, and the Poisson ratio is 0 0.3, dead giveaway of what my units are going to be. They're going to be kips and inches. At this point, I'll dismiss out of there. Now, here comes the interesting part. I'm going to have to create a section, and this time I have to create a W14 by 53 column. And it's going to be not a solid, not a shell, it's going to be a beam element of the type. It'll be a beam type element, not a truss type element. You know the difference between the two. Trusses can only take actual forces, whereas beams can have actual forces, shear forces, and bending moments. So it'll be of the type beam. And as I go to this part, it says, it asks me a few questions. Do I want the section integration to be done during the analysis or before the analysis? Now I can specify it uh, either way. Right now I'm going to specify during analysis so it will do the integration and this will play out a role in the second part of our course when we get to plasticity of members. But for now the answers are going to be the same whether I do during or before analysis because it's a very simple shape. Then I can provide the cross-section, I can provide a profile name. So let's create a new profile. And the name of the profile will be W14 by 53. This is going to be the cross-section. And it's asking me, is it a box-shaped cross-section, a pipe, a circular cross-section, rectangular? I'm going to select the I-shaped cross-section. Also notice that there's an arbitrary and a generalized, and you can go ahead and use those if you ever need to. Right now, I'm just selecting an I-shaped cross-section. And there, now it's asking me for some key dimensions. It's asking me for B1 and B2, width of the flanges h depth of the cross section t1 and t2 the thickness of the flanges t3 the thickness of the web and it's asking me for this cryptic dimension l which actually corresponds to the center of gravity the elastic centroid of the cross section 
Now, the W14 by 53 is a doubly symmetric cross section. So L will obviously be equal to H over two, but I also need the dimensions for the W14 by 53. So right now in my hand is my AIC steel manual. And I'm looking at the W14 by 53, and it tells me that its depth, its total depth, or the value of H is going to be 13.9. And if this is 13.9, then I know that L, which will be located right at the center, will be 6.95. It tells me the width of the flanges are 8.06 inches. I'm entering that information. And it tells me that the thickness of the flanges is 0.66. I'm entering that information. And the thickness of the web T3 in this case is equal to 0 0.370. Now, clearly this set of dimensions, while reasonable, do not account for the K region or the fillet region where the flange and web junctions meet. So the properties, while they are provided here, are going to come up with slightly approximate moments of inertia as compared to the more precise moment of inertia that can be specified. <coughs> so now in this case, we've specified the profile name. The material is steel. Now you can also directly specify the stiffnesses. You can specify transfer shear stiffnesses and so on. We won't do that right now. We'll instead leave everything else in the default range. And uh, there is no need to define a section Poisson ratio. The material, it has already gone in and picked. There was only one material, steel. So it has picked it. It's asking me something about temperature variation, variation which I don't need to worry about. So at this point, I've created the beam shape. And I can assign this section to these two wire member. So it's asking me to select the regions to be assigned a section. I'm selecting the two columns of the frame using my shift key. Selected multiple. Here we go. Both of those lines are red. I'm clicking done and it will ask me well, what kind of a section do you want to assign? And since there was only one defined, it selected the W14 by 53. It's so a beam type element, the material is steel, and I click OK, and I'm out of there. Great. Now, I need to define one more cross-section, which is going to be a W18 by 65. This is also going to be a beam. Same exercise as before. It's going to be a new profile. The name of that profile will be W18 by 65. It'll be an I-shaped cross-section. I'll press continue, and it's asking me for the same set of dimensions. So now I will uh, look up the 18 by 65 in my manual, and its total depth is 18.4 inches, which tells me that its centroid will be located at 9.2. B1 and B2, the widths of the flange are 7.59. And the thickness of the flange is 0 0.75. The thickness of the web is equal to 0 0.45. There we go. Those are all the dimensions that I've put in. Material name is steel. Everything else stays the same. And it's the profile W18 by 65. I can click OK now. And now I can assign this to the beam section. So I'll go back into the assignment. I'll select the beam. And this time I'll assign it with the section W18 by 65. 
All right, this was the new part of the steps because I'm now defining a beam element. At this point, I'm done defining all the beams and columns of the frame so I can get out of this module. But before I go out of this module, I want to check something. I want to make sure that the that I understand the normals or the directions one and two associated with these beam elements. In order to do that, I'm going to start looking at assigning the beam orientation. Now I can select each beam and check its orientation. So for example, when I select this beam, it tells me that the orientation, that means which is the first node and the second node, the direction one and the direction two, will show that to me in a moment. There we go, that shows the direction one. It goes from the bottom node to the node on top. And clearly the tangent will be normal to it and we'll see that a little bit later. That makes sense. So we'll just enter. There we go, one and two. That's very nice. Some of you have done this in SAP 2000 or other software, it's very similar to that. Again, repeating that step for other beams. I think you can do multiple beams and columns at the same time. There we go. And then I can do the last beam as well. And there we go. We have defined the directions, the local directions one and two associated with these beam elements, and that's helpful. Uh, at this point, we are done with the property module and we are ready to move on to the next module, which will be the assembly. Now, the assembly module is very straightforward. There is no interaction there are no different modules or frames that need to be connected to each other for this problem. It's perhaps one of the simplest models out there. So all I need to do is include this instance and we're done with the assembly module. As far as step goes, we need to create once again a static analysis step, same as before. There's nothing new. It's already identified that it's going to be a general static analysis with nonlinear geometry off and just frame analysis. This is a static analysis, so the time period really doesn't mean anything here. Uh, incrementation is automatic and so on. Very straightforward step as well. But before we run away from this module, we need to make sure that we have requested the correct outputs. Otherwise, we'll be struggling to find the information that we need. All right, so this is where um, uh, all the information has been pre-selected. But as I said before, we can drill down and identify what we need, or we can just go ahead and click on everything so that we can have all the results that we need. Here, I'm going to request for output at um, default locations in the beam elements. Now, you can specify locations 135, 13579, and so on, but I won't get into that right now. I'll just use the default values, and it will include the local coordinate directions when available. Done. With this analysis step done, uh, interaction, once again, there are no two parts, so there's no interaction. Uh, we get to load. And here, we need to assign the boundary condition. So I can create a boundary condition. Uh, it will be a displacement type boundary condition. And I'm going to place it here. I'm also going to provide it here. With this done, I can specify, in this case, I'm gonna go with fixed, fixed boundary conditions. How about that? We'll, let, we'll assign fixed boundary conditions for this. It's done, and you can see the symbols identifying the fixed boundary condition. 
U1, U2, and UR3 are all restrained. Now we have to define the loads. As far as the loading goes, I'm going to create some concentrate force loadings. Uh, concentrated force type mechanical loadings. They'll be applied at the columns right there and right there. Go. Both those nodes have been selected. This time I'll say done and apply a concentrated force in the minus y direction and a force in the plus x direction. So CF1, CF1 is going to be acting in the one direction which is going to be the x-axis. So I'm going to apply 30 kips at each node. And CF2 will be the uh, uh, downwards load now applied with a negative sign. So it will be minus 250. And you can see the two loads being placed right there. There's my concentrated force acting downwards of minus 250. There's my positive 30. So a total of 60 kips has been applied laterally and a total, total vertical compression of minus 500 kips has been applied. In addition to that, I want to create a line load applied to the beam, a distributed load, if you will. So I'll create, this time it will be a line load that will be applied to the beam. It will just be a distributed load and we'll apply it with the value of uh, so many kips per inch. So it's asking me what is the system I want it in the global system. It's a uniform distribution. You can of course have a user defined where you can apply a triangular and so on. Uh, there's no component, that means there's no x direction, there's no component one. There's component two, and you can specify a simple value of let's say 0 0.1 kip per inch, which over a length of 120 inches will become approximately uh, 12 kips that will be applied. And there you go, there's the vertical lead downwards acting distributed load. So there are different ways to go about uh, applying the load to the structure. You can also go back in and edit. For example, if I didn't like, uh, if I wanted to change the magnitude of the load from minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, I could do that. So I've done that now. And I have defined the loads. I've defined the uh, boundary conditions. At this time, it looks like all I need to do is define the mesh and I will be ready to do to submit the job.